Welcome back, everyone, to Elliptic Curves. So uh, let's continue where we left off. So previously, last time, um, oh, by the way, before I start, there's a new homework set posted on the website, homework set number two. And uh, so try those out also as you go along. All right, so in, uh, in previous uh, lectures, particular last uh, couple lectures, we started talking about divisors, uh, the group of uh, divisors on a curve, which is a, a free abelian group uh, supported on points. Uh, so each divisor is just a formal sum uh, on of integers that are supported on points. And we use those to keep track of information about some of our functions. So for example, we have these kind of divisors, the divisors of a function keep track of the zeros and poles of a function, which uh, those are meromorphic func as meromorphic functions that tell you quite a bit about a function anyway. So that's a lot of important information. And we know uh, that, for example, the divisor is zero if and only if the function is a constant. And we know that the degree of a divisor of a function is zero. Uh, and that is because there are as many poles or there, or there are zeros on a projective function. Okay, and uh, we computed the divisors of two important functions for us. Those are functions on an elliptic curve uh, with, uh, with, uh, with f of x being, so y squared equals f of x. Um, so y, this is for y squared equals x minus e1, x minus e2 x minus e3, right? Okay, then we talked about principal divisors, which are those that are divisors of a function, and we can do a quotient, and we call that a Picard group. If we do the quotient by divisors of degree zero, then uh, those are, uh, that gives you the Picard zero group. We talked about differentials, so differentials are, again, there's some, sort of some, um, algebraic nonsense of symbols dx, but somehow they end up encoding a lot of very important information. Uh, so if you have these symbols subject to uh, the conditions that look like, uh, well, like differentials, then uh, you have that uh, the differentials is a one-dimensional space over the function field of your curve. And then we have a T, a uniformizer at a smooth point, and dt is a basis of the uh, differentials up to uh, the constant being in the function field. So every differential is going to be some g times dt, where g is a function on the curve. We also uh, define the divisor of a function. So this is by definition, uh, the divisor of a differential uh, was defined as follows. And we remark that it's important to notice that the, the divisor is defined an order of vanishing of functions that change with the uniformizer at p. In in general, they change. We've seen that, for example, in p1, uh, they all look um, the dt. You can just pick dx all the time. So uh, great. So um, let's see what else. Yeah. So we computed. Uh, we computed that. We computed the divisor of a differential on p1 of a non-zero differential on P1, and we computed also for an elliptic curve of that form, we computed the uh, space of uh, differentials that is generated by dx over y, and we ended a uh, class showing that the divisor of dx over y is zero, is identically zero. And we say that that is a non-vanishing holomorphic differential, okay? We also define KC, so KC is the canonical divisor class. The canonical divisor class on our curve is just a divisor of a non-zero differential in the Picard group. Okay, and we saw then uh, we have, well, we have two uh, non-zero differentials on P1. Uh, you can take uh, the canonical class to be the class of uh, the divisor minus two times infinity. And on an elliptic curve, you can take the canonical class to be just the class of zero, of the zero divisor, because, uh, um, because of that thing we just calculated above. And today, we finally get to see uh, Riemann-Roch. Great. So um, 
Let's go next. So today we're going to see, uh, we're going to talk about Riemann Rock. We're also going to talk about uh, Horowitz theorem. Riemann Rock is going to be the star of the day. You've probably heard of Riemann. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of Rock. So Gustav Rock, um, both Riemann and Rock uh, died quite young. Uh, Riemann died at age 39. Rock died at age 26. So it turns out that um, Rock started his career uh, studying chemistry, uh, so essentially as an undergrad. Then in the, his master's, he moved towards physics and studied ele electromagnetism. But some of his uh, professors noticed that his mathematical ability was very strong. So he went to uh, Gottingen to, uh, to study more uh, math. And he started studying under uh, people like Riemann and Weierstrass and others. And uh, he ended up doing a, a, his the equivalent of a PhD in Germany at the time. And so uh, a, theory, a PhD on abelian functions. And then he started some work related to algebraic geometry. And he generalized the theorem of Riemann, which later Max and other uh, referred to it as the Riemann-Rock theorem. And it's the theorem we're going to see. Um, unfortunately, uh, Rock fell ill uh, with uh, consumption, which is how they refer to tuberculosis uh, back then, and passed away at age 26, so really, really young. Okay, so uh, let's, um, let's then talk about Riemann Rock. For Riemann Rock, we're going to need a couple of other definitions, so let me start with uh, uh, two more definitions here. Uh, we are going to define uh, positive divisors. So a divisor uh, is uh, positive or effective uh, even only if, or sometimes we just say that D is big or equal to zero. Uh, even only if uh, that all the NPs are positive or zero, so not negative. Okay, and uh, we are going to say that uh, D1 is bigger or equal to D2, even only if D1 minus D2 is uh, positive. I think it should be non negative. So um, we can say effective maybe is a better terminology. All right. So those are uh, effectiveness. And then we can compare divisors. And um, then the Riemann Rock theorem talks about some spaces of functions on a curve. So uh, here is the space. So if you have a divisor, then we define and space LD, that's calligraphic L for me. And those are functions in the function field such that the divisor of F is bigger or equal to minus D. And we also add the zero function in there so that this becomes a, a vector space. Okay, um, so um, let me let me give you an example of. Or, or actually, we also define L of D to be the dimension over K bar of the space L D. Okay, so let me give you an example of what this means. So, for example. If I have a function, let's just take D to be, oops, too thick. Let's take D to just be one point. Okay, I'm going to have one device that's supported at one point. Oh, which just should bring to memory the point at infinity of an elliptic curve. Then what does it mean for the divisor of a function to be bigger or equal to minus D, uh, this means uh, that the divisor of F is 
bigger or equal to minus O, uh, which means that the divisor of F plus O is effective. And that means then, uh, if I write the divisor of, um, of my function as um, some sum of NPs, plus O big or equal to zero, uh, then what this means is that, uh, well, we have that uh, for, we, we can write it again, uh, the sum of P not O, oh, not parentheses there, just O, P not O of NP times P, plus the divisor at O, so now I have N O plus one times O. This is effective. So what that means then to be effective means that N P is big or equal to zero for all P not O, and N O is big or equal to minus one uh, for P equals O, right? So what this is just saying, is that uh, that condition is saying, so first there are uh, no poles at P not O, and the pole at O is at worst uh, of order one. Uh, a pole of order at most one at O. Okay, so what this is saying, uh, these spaces are keeping track of information. So for example, if I now, instead of uh, D just being O, if I had O minus P, then what it says is that there is at least a zero at P and there is a, at most a pole of order one at O. Okay, so it's imposing some zeros and poles on functions. Um, in so those spaces are keeping track of what function have at least some sort of zero at some point and at, at, at most some type of pole at some other points. Okay, so uh, Riemann Rock tells you something about uh, these spaces. So let me uh, let me go to uh, the next. Slide. I don't know why it's not letting me. Where's my folder button? Okay. Uh, so here's a proposition about these spaces. Uh, so it turns out that uh, A, if the degree of your divisor is negative, then the LD space is zero. Uh, let's, let's remind us again uh, what LD means. So LD is again functions okay. So um, So if the degree is uh, negative, then um, that can happen because then um, you would you would you would say that there are no. Um, well, let, let me just say. Uh, so what what happens if the degree of d is uh, negative? Um, then the divisor of f, which is zero, plus a degree which is negative. Uh, cannot be effective, okay? If you look at the condition, uh, because we know that the degrees of functions are, the degree of a divisor is zero, if you add something that is of negative degree, that cannot be effective. So there is nothing there except the zero function. B, uh, it turns out that this is a finite dimensional uh, K hat uh, vector space, 
which um, which then makes sense that we define LD to be uh, the dimension over K bar of LD as we did. Uh, so that is a finite number. And C, if D and D prime are equivalent, remember that means that D minus D prime is the divisor of some function in the function field, then the L spaces are isomorphic. And their dimensions then are the same. All right. So here's a question for you then. What is uh, the L space of the zero divisor? And what is the dimension of that space? So what happens here, again, if you think of uh, functions f such that the divisor is bigger or equal to minus the zero divisor, so that is just the zero, then this means that uh, divisor of f is effective. And that means that if this is the sum of np times p, then all the NPs are big or equal to zero. What does that say about a function? That it doesn't have any poles. It doesn't have any poles. What kind of functions do not have poles? Uh, the nice ones. The nice ones, which were uh, in projective space, you are either a constant or have poles. So, if, if by nice ones you mean the constant functions, then yeah, the constant functions. So that tells you then that uh, the L of O is just the constants, and that has a one dimension. So L of O is one. Okay. Um, so again, it's very useful to keep track of what does L space mean in terms of poles. So if you have L of zero, is a function with no poles whatsoever, so it has to be uh, forcefully a, um, a constant function. Okay, all right, great. So then we can we can go ahead and state. Pablo, uh, can I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, when you wrote negative zero equals zero. Yeah. Uh, is that so? I. It's the coefficient of zero is negative one, not that negative zero equals zero. Um, is just that this is just the zero uh, divisor, so it's like the vector with all zeros. So oh, okay. minus okay. zero, so it is it is still zero, and it's actually the zero. This is not o, or so it is, there is not minus one times o. This is the number zero, so that's why minus zero equals zero. Okay, so there is no minus one in any coefficient. All the coefficients are zeros. Yeah, great, thank you. All right, so here is the, the riemann rock theorem. The riemann rock theorem says that, so let C be a smooth curve. Um, let KC be a canonical divisor. A canonical divisor here, meaning not the class in Picard, but any element that is a representative of the class of the canonical divisor in the Picard group. So the divisor, this is just a divisor of a differential that is non-zero. Okay. Uh, then there is an integer uh, g. 
called the genus of C, which is what we were after defining genus, such that uh, for all divisors of C, we have the following equality. The dimension of the LD space minus the dimension of the KC minus D space equals the degree of D minus G plus one. Okay, so there's one number that no matter what divisor you put there, it's going to work. This equation is going to work. Okay, so um, let me then, uh, let me repeat the equation here and draw some conclusions and then do some examples of this that are going to be in our favor. Okay, so here is a corollary is that um, A, uh, the dimension of the KC space, so if you take D to be KC, that is G. How do you figure that out? Uh, well, just take uh, in Riemann Rock. So in that equation, take uh, D to be zero, right? If D is zero, then we know that LD, uh, so let me let me actually write something here down. Uh, so if, L, if D is zero, then what I get is uh, L of zero, let me just, which I know is one. So this is one minus, uh, uh, yeah, take D to be zero, and then L of KC uh, equals the degree of zero is zero uh, minus G plus one, right? And then you get that the, the dimension of the KC space is exactly G, right? Great. Uh, second, uh, the degree of the canonical divisor is 2g minus 2. Hmm. So uh, now how do we prove that? Just take d now to be a canonical divisor and then what you get is the dimension of the kc space which is g minus l of 0 because kc minus kc is going to be 0 so l of 0 which is 1 equals uh, the degree of the KC divisor um, minus G plus one, and then you solve, and you get that the degree of the canonical divisor has to be uh, 2G minus two. Okay, and C, I'm not going to prove this one. C, uh, if, uh, yeah, if the degree of D is bigger than 2G minus 2, uh, then the uh, the dimension of the LD space is degree of D minus G plus 1. Okay, so let's, um, let's do some examples right here. Uh, let's start with P1. So if I take uh, P1, then I know that the function field of P1 is just the function field in one variable, right? And uh, we computed that the, uh, the differentials on P1 are generated by just dx, the, the function or the differential gx, dx, and uh, we that is a non that's a non-zero differential. So we computed the divisor of that differential. So the um, the canonical divisor can be minus two times infinity. Uh, this is uh, the point uh, one zero in projected coordinates, uh, which is the divisor 
of dx, which we computed. Okay, so then you see that um, what is the genus of P1? I don't know, but it has to be that uh, the degree of the canonical divisor is to G minus two. So uh, the degree of the canonical divisor is to G minus two on one hand, but on the other hand, I have it right here. And the degree is minus two. So that tells me that the uh, the genus of P1 is has to be zero. Okay. What about elliptic curves? Well, not elliptic curves, but the equations we've been calling elliptic curves all the time, but we had not justified that the genus was one. So uh, what if I have a curve of the form x minus e1 times x minus e2 times x minus e3, which is smooth, which by the way, it just amounts to the EIs being all different. Um, then uh, we know what is uh, what a non zero differential that we've calculated the divisor was dx over y. So dx over y is non zero. Okay. Uh, it is non zero because we actually computed the. Uh, we, we, we computed that we, we can use it as a as a uh, non-zero holomorphic differential on uh, on omega z, and uh, the divisor is exactly zero. So um, the canonical divisor can be picked to be exactly zero. And uh, therefore, the dimension of the space Kc is the same that L of zero, which I know is one. But by Riemann Rock, this is supposed to be G. So G is one. Okay. So these are curves of genus one. By the way, also by Riemann Rock. Uh, we have that if uh, if we have a divisor of positive degree by part C of this corollary, then this is uh, 2G minus 2, right? And therefore, uh, the dimension of an any LD space is going to be degree of D minus one plus one, so is degree of D. That's going to be very useful in a moment. Okay, fantastic. So we have that these uh, equations are, um, are, um, are of genus one. You can actually uh, do uh, more generally uh, more generally, you can talk about uh, curves of the form y squared plus a1xy plus a3y equals x cubed plus a2x squared plus a4x plus a6 with the ais in your um, base field and smooth, um, I will, we'll, we'll talk also uh, a little bit later why the strange numbering, uh, in particular, why is that A6 and not A5? Um, but um, if you have this, you can also prove 
that uh, holomorphic differential and unvanishing holomorphic differential is given by dx over 2y plus a1x plus a3. Is also uh, uh, non vanishing uh, holomorphic, and the degree of this divide of this uh, uh, differential is um, I'm sorry, the degree of the divisor. Is also zero, so uh, so that also checks that uh, the same argument from Riemann Rock tells you that the genus of these curves are also is also one. Okay, so um, now we are in a position to talk about uh, these kind of equations, how they are actually related to all curves of genus one. So here is an important. Uh, proposition now and now we're finally escaping the territory of chapters one and two of Silverman this is in uh, essentially in chapter three uh, result 3.1 uh, so uh, three parts a if I have a curve of this form as above y squared plus a1 xy plus a3y equals x cubed plus a2x squared plus a4x uh, plus a6 uh, is a smooth curve. Over k. Um, and notice that it has a, the, well, it, it has a point. Okay, so there, there's a point in here, there's at least one point, which is uh, 0, 1, 0 in projective coordinates still belongs there. Uh, so if this is a smooth curve, then it is a curve of genus one. That's what we just proved above. But the interesting part is uh, a converse to this. So let E, be a, a smooth curve of genus one uh, defined over k uh, with a point so also over k Okay, so we just any genus one curve defined over K. Uh, so a curve being a projective variety of dimension one, genus one, uh, then there are functions, there exist functions X and Y over K in the function field of E over k such that uh, the function that maps e to p2 sending p to x of p y of p 1 is an isomorphism uh, of e onto a curve given by uh, as in A. Okay, given by a model uh, which we call via stress models. The y square equals x cubed plus ax plus b, though that we'll call a short via stress model. The full model like this is called a via stress model. Um, it turns out that if you have characteristic not two or three, then you always have a short via stress model, and we'll see that. Uh, but if you want to work for any characteristic, then you have to work over 
uh, these longer Weierstrass models uh, in this isomorphism such that phi of O, this point at, of E that this is just a generic, just some curve of genus one, this point maps to zero, one, zero. Okay. And uh, part C, so uh, again, this is called a Weierstrass equation. This is called a Weierstrass model. So part C is that if I have, this is one Weierstrass model, but there can be all the Weierstrass models. There are many changes of variables that could just uh, preserve that shape of a model. So if you have any two Weierstrass models for an equation E as in A or B, uh, they are related by a linear change of variables of the form x is uh, u is squared x, x prime plus r and y is u cubed y prime plus s u is squared x prime plus t with uh, u r s t in k and u not zero. Okay, so any two Weierstrass models are actually related. If you have another one, they're related by a very simple uh, change of variables, uh, which is linear in x and y. Okay, so uh, we've proved A, so I'm going to prove B for you. Um, so uh, let's do that. So let's uh, prove B, and here is where um, Riemann Rock is going to come in. So we start with, uh, so let E be again uh, a smooth curve of genus one uh, over K with O also over K, let me let me actually write that better. Um, with O in, uh, in E over K. So we have at least one rational point, one K rational point. Great, so what are we gonna do is consider uh, the spaces of functions on, uh, on E that are given by uh, the L spaces. Okay, so I'm going to consider the spaces L N times O uh, for N bigger or equal to one. Okay, and remember that uh, Riemann Rock says that because the genus is one, it tells me that the uh, that if I have a divisor that is of degree of positive degree, then the dimension is degree of D. So the degree tells me the dimension of my L space. All right, so why is this going to work? Uh, what we're going to build is, uh, we're going to start building bases of these spaces until we reach a space where I have I can write more elements than there are uh, dimensions. If I have too many elements, then there's gonna be a linear relationship between them. And that linear relationship is going to give me a model for my curve, okay? So uh, first start with uh, L of one times O. So this is just, uh, the divisor is just O. Uh, this dimension is one. The degree is one, so it is within the, uh, the where we can apply that formula. And uh, that tells me then, um, what is this space? It turns out that I already, I always have K bar. I always have 
the, the constant functions. And that is already one dimensional, so there cannot be any more. So there's no function that has exactly one pole at O. Okay, so uh, these have no poles, but remember that the space LO is telling me that there are at least, at least a pole, uh, or at most a pole of order one. No poles, that counts. So K bar is there, and that's dimension one, so that's all we have. Okay. Let's try two times O. Two times O, dimension is two. So there has to be something new in here. There is for sure the constants. And there's going to be something new. I'm going to call it X. Some function. I don't know what function that is, but there is a function in there called call it X. And this is, uh, these are, uh, generator, so these are bases over k hat. It turns out, I didn't mention this before, but there is a proposition in Silverman. So it turns out that you can actually find generators if your curve is defined over k, you can find your generators uh, of the L spaces defined over k. So, so the proposition implies that x is actually a function in the uh, in the base field function field okay so or the base field of the function field over the base field of k so x is defined over k itself all right moreover what do we know about the poles of x um what we know is that it has a pole that is at most of order two okay so this tells me that X is in L2, uh, X has a pole of order at most two at O, okay? Uh, but if it was of, of order one, if the order at O of X is minus one, then that would tell me that x is in the space l o but we know there are only constants and then uh, the l2 space would be also one dimensional but that is a contradiction okay so uh, that cannot be and uh, what that tells me then is that the pole has to be is at most of order two. It has more than order one, so it has to be exactly of order two. So uh, the order of vanishing at x of o is exactly minus two. There's a pole of order two. Great. Now we move on. Let's try uh, the third dimensional space, 3 o. That is, uh, again, dimension three. Let's find a basis for my space. Uh, there is the constant functions. X is there because it has a pole of order two, and it's the condition here is at most order three, so X is still there. And now there's gonna be a third uh, generator, a third basis element over K, which is going to be called, I'm gonna call it Y. Okay, same argument as above tells me that this new generator has to have a pole of order exactly three. Is at most of order three. If it was less, then the dimensions do not match. Okay, so uh, now I have my X and my Y. Now I need a relationship between the two. So keep going. Um, if you Let's let's what happens with L four. This is dimension four. Can I come up with enough functions? Uh, one x and y are there, uh, but x has a pole over the two. X squared has a pole over the four. X and x squared are not just uh, they are not related. Uh, up to constants, so this is a new function x squared, and that can be a generator of the space. 
Okay. So what about five? I have now one x, y, x squared, and x times y has a pole of order five. So there's a new function here. Great. How about six? Uh, well, I have one x, y, x is square, x, y, uh, what else? x cubed has a pole of order six and um y square has a pole of order six uh oh but now i have uh so this is uh dimension six and i have one two three four five six seven functions it's gonna be a linear relationship between those uh, functions, okay? So uh, let's write it down. So uh, again, we have that the six times O space is six dimensional and there is at least all these functions are there. Um, what did I have X squared, X, Y, X cubed and Y squared. They're all there but there's gonna be a linear relationship. Uh, so they're linear dependent over K. Remember that all these functions were built to be functions defined over K. So there's a linear dependency over K now. So uh, we're gonna call that um, A1 plus A2X plus A3Y plus A4X squared plus A5 x y plus a six x cubed plus a seven y square equals zero with for some a i's in k okay and again it's crucial that here i don't have it over k hat or over k bar in the algebraic closure i made sure i could find generators of my spaces that already find over k and if there is a relation of the functions and they're all defined over k, the relation is defined over k. Great. So um, what happens here is that you see, if you look at poles, this is a function that when I add it all together, I get zero. But this function here, different color, uh, it's maybe highlighted. This function here and this function here, um, have each one of them a pole of order six and none of the other have pole of order six if this is the zero function these two functions have to cancel out so that there is no pole of order six at the end of the day there is going to be zero uh, pole zero of zeros but these two together have to cancel the pole of order six so what that implies is that uh, so let me write it here pole uh, order six, pole order six. What that implies is that a six times a seven cannot be zero. Neither a six or a seven can be zero. Um, if they were both zero, then there would be a relationship between functions that should be linearly independent. Uh, so one of the two, both of them have to be non-zero. And um, and then I can do a change of variables. I'm going to change x by uh, minus a6, a7x, and y by a6, a7 square y. The, the, what I'm trying to do is remove the coefficients of x cubed and y squared at the same time with this change of variables and divide uh, through by a6 cubed and a7 to the fourth, and uh, what you get is a bias stress equation. 
all I needed was to make a change of variables. So the X given the Y square have coefficient uh, one uh, so that I can move um, and, and then just rearrange the equation and you get a value stress equation. Okay. All right, so what that gives me is, um, what, what is that? That's just uh, uh, an equation. So what that gives me is that I can build a function phi that goes from, uh, from E to, um, uh, to P2 that sends a point P to XP YP1 and then you see that what is actually happening is that this, because the X and the Y are related by this value source equation, they are actually given by, so a value source equation Z, um, Y squared plus A1 X Y plus dot, 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 dot X cubed, dot, 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 dot. So this is actually landing on, uh, on a, on, on a, curve given by a value stress equation. So I have a map. What I want is, is this an isomorphism? That's what I need. I Just having a map is not good enough. I need an isomorphism here. So uh, what we're going to, what we're, I'm going to try to prove then is that the degree of phi is one, okay? In which case, what that proves is that the function field of E is exactly given by the y, the x and the y function, and um, and that is going to give me that this map is an isomorphism. Okay. So can I? Sorry, can yeah. I interrupt with a quick question? Yeah. Uh, so, would it be alright if we went back to the previous slide? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So in the progression of, of, of looking at uh, the dimension of three times O and then looking at the corresponding space, should yeah. for, for N equals four, five, six, should, should we be able to sort of intuitively see how those, how, how the X and Y functions are, are, like how these sort of new functions are being introduced into the, the space. So going from one X, Y to, all right, suddenly it's X squared and not like a different function Z. Um, and then X squared to X, Y, et cetera. I mean, what I, what I can tell you is that there is a, there is a fourth function in that space that generates, um, but as a vector space, what I can tell you is that because there is a fourth function, we can call it Z if you want. Yeah. But let's look at the function X squared. It turns out that the function X squared cannot be linearly dependent with X and Y. It's not just like, um, I mean, I'm, I haven't proved that. At least you can see that it's not like uh, the function X squared is not a constant times X uh, and so on. But it doesn't, that actually doesn't quite matter. I'm, so those, those functions generate these spaces, but what matters is that at the end of the day in dimension six, whether those are linearly independent or not, whether these functions that I wrote before are linearly independent or not, I have seven vectors in a vector space of dimension six. Therefore, maybe, maybe this is just Maybe they are uh, X and Y are the only ones that are linearly independent or something. But what matters is that I have seven vectors in a dimension six vector space. Therefore, this has to be there has to be a linear relationship between those vectors. Okay. Okay. So I have not proved for you that X square is linearly independent from X and Y. Maybe X square is something like X plus Y, but actually it cannot be. Uh, because of poles. X squared has a pole of order four. 
any linear combination of one X and Y has a pole for at most order three. So X squared is new. So I have a vector that is linearly independent from the others. It is in the space L4, so it has to be uh, a generator uh, over the vector, uh, in the vector space over a field that has to be a generator of my space. That has to be four dimensional. So I can pick X squared as a new function. Okay, so the, the one thing that we haven't shown is that, that X squared is linearly independent from X and Y, but at the end, it doesn't quite matter. It doesn't, it doesn't matter at the end. So we're looking at, I could have skipped the steps four and five there mm -hmm. and just go to the sixth space, but I figure I, I would let you see that the fourth space doesn't, doesn't work, the fifth space doesn't work. The sixth space is where I can actually write seven functions that have to be linearly dependent. This trick actually works in, in greater generality to find models of other curves uh, of higher genus. You can, you can play this game and that's how you actually build models in some cases of, of other curves. But then you have to go to other spaces to larger dimensions where you are going to find uh, enough functions that are going to generate the space. And then you find a linear relation and then you have a model for your curve. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Great question. So let's um, let's prove that this is uh, um, that this is degree one. So for that, I'm going to consider first uh, the projection from E to P one, where I'm actually only keeping the x coordinate of my curve. We've looked at this map in in quite a bit of detail over the last few uh, lectures and uh, we know that the degree of this map is two okay um, but then also what that tells me is that uh, the extension of function fields afforded, afforded by the map is the degree of the map, which is two. Okay. Uh, similarly, I can project to, um, to the Y coordinate. Okay, and uh, you can work it out in the same way to see that the degree of this one is three. Okay, if you look at the um, at the relationship at the linear at the relationship between the y and the x, then you can see that um, this map is also three. Or um, actually. Uh, I think this is not quite right. Yes, I, I, I now I realize that this is not quite right because our, our the way we figure out that the degree was two was by actually assuming that E had a value stress model that we were starting for y square equals x minus e one. So uh, that it had a value stress model, and then we did that to compute the degree and found the degree is two. Um, so we have to actually work out this in another way. So let me uh, work it out in another way using ramification. So this map actually sends um, O to one zero because uh, X has only poles at O, then you can see that this is going to send O to infinity in P1. And, um, so X has a pole or there are two at O, no other poles. And then we know we have a formula for the degree of the map in terms of ramification. would be psi one 
minus one of uh, Q. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, but you see only O goes to one zero. So there's actually, uh, so only O goes to infinity and therefore, because only O maps to one zero under psi one, that tells you that uh, the ramification index at O is going to be two, and there is no other, uh, yeah, so, so if you take what are the parameters of infinity in P1, there is only O, the ramification is two, and that gives you that the degree is two. Okay, so then this one similarly, uh, we compute using the same idea, but now that Y has a pole of order three, you can check that the degree of this one is three. Okay. And um, what this means is, so uh, first the degree of psi one is two tells you that the, um, extension of function fields is two. The fact that the degree of the projection on the y coordinate is three tells you that the extension of function fields is of degree three. And now uh, we have a field diagram of function fields. I have ke, I have uh, k of x, y, I have in here kx, and I have here ky. I want to know what is the degree here. Uh, but what I know is that this degree is two and this degree is three. So if this is degree d, then um, d divides two because uh, the, those degrees are multiplicative. Right, so this degree here times this degree here has to be two. So d divides two, d divides three, and d is an integer, a positive integer, then d has to be one. And that tells me what I wanted, which is that ke to kxy, that is actually one. And uh, therefore, the degree of the map phi being the phi that sent, um, it's here, this phi map. Uh, the degree of phi is one. And uh, those are, that map is a morphism, so it is an isomorphism of, um, of, of curves. where C is given by a bias stress equation. Okay. Great. So now we have that, that every curve of genus one has a bias stress model. I can write it as, a, uh, as an equation of a curve in bias stress model. Let me finish off. Sorry that I didn't take a break. This is going to be a, a bit of a longer video today. Um, so suppose now that I have two Weierstrass models. Suppose C, C prime are um, curves in a Weierstrass model and um, C and C prime are isomorphic over K, uh, then I have my coordinates, so I have uh, X and Y here, and I have X prime and Y prime here with a relationship that is a Weierstrass uh, relationship. Um, then what this tells me is that both one and X and one and X prime are bases 
for L2O. Okay, so those two functions are going to be bases for the same uh, space and uh, one X and Y and uh, one X prime and Y prime are bases for L3O. Okay, basically you're given a value stress model for the curve. What you're giving is there are functions in the function field what we did above, if you look at what we've done above, is construct functions in the function field and show that they show they satisfy some relation in the uh, some algebraic relation. So if I have two different models for a for the same curve, so they're incarnations of the same curve E, then uh, what I'm constructing is a set of functions x y, a set of functions uh, x prime y prime, but in the same spirit, if I constructed them in the same way x and x prime would be two elements of two that of two o that have exactly a pole of order two but then because these are bases for l2 um, for a vector space over k then there's got to be a linear relationship over k so x is uh, u x prime plus r and y also has to have an expression in terms of the x prime and the y prime in this case um sorry this is supposed to be uh u2 y prime plus s2 x prime plus t uh for some um uh, for some u1 r u2 oops uh s two u2 and t in k but notice though that um, we have a model right so y square equals x cubed the dot so therefore um, when you change the variables the u1 cube and u2 square actually have to match so u1 cube has to be u2 uh, a square. So if you let u be u2 over u1 and let s be s2 over u squared, then uh, we get the change of variables that the theorem said, that the proposition said. Um, so you can uh, work that part out. Um, then the proposition said this, that we have a a change of variables. You see, the the point was that uh, we have the same u uh, in in we have u square and u cube in the change of variables, and that's what happens. Um, so all I did is uh, we had the change of variables, except that perhaps with two different constants here. And what this shows is that if you take that common u, then you can reduce that uh, constant to be the same u in both cases except that a square and cube okay so uh so that's great so now we've applied um we have applied riemann rock to construct um via stress equations for our curves of genus one okay let me finish off i have another uh five minutes and then um we'll stop one more theorem uh, that is very important is the Hurwitz formula or the Riemann Hurwitz formula. So this says the following let phi be uh, uh, non constant uh, separable. Uh, map of smooth curves. Then there is a formula that says that two G1, G1 being uh, the genus. So this is genus G1, this is genus G2. It turns out the G9 are uh, 
related by 2g1 minus 2 is bigger or equal to the degree of the function of the map times 2g2 minus 2 plus the sum of ramification divisors or the, the sum of ramification indices minus 1 for the curve. Okay. So, uh, oh, and moreover, the important part here is that if uh, we have we have equality, uh, so there is equality, not just an inequality. If uh, uh, if the correct if the characteristic of k is zero of the base field, or uh, the characteristic of k is p, a positive characteristic, uh, but p does not divide any of the ramification indices. Okay, and um, the way you use uh, the Riemann-Hurwitz formula is, for example, uh, to compute uh, the genus of one curve given the genus of another curve that you know. Okay, so for example, um, I can compute again the genus of a, of a, uh, of a bias stress equation. So take, for example, um, a map that goes from uh, something like this to P1 that sends uh, x, y, z to x, z, like we've done before, then uh, what we checked is that it's actually, this map is ramified at four points. Uh, it is ramified at uh, P1, P2, and P3, and it is ramified at O, and the ramification indices is two in each one of those cases. So I suppose you don't know the um, you don't know the genus of your curve E. Then what you can do is use the formula. So I don't know it. So two G one and this is let's say over Q or something. Just there was some field of characteristic zero. So there is an equality. The genus of E minus two has to be uh, the degree of the map is two, so this is two times two times the genus of P1. That one we know we computed the genus is zero using Riemann Rock uh, plus the uh, ramification indices. So this is going to be the ramification index of P1 minus one. So two minus one plus two minus one plus two minus one plus two minus one. So this is uh, what minus four plus uh, four, so this is zero, and therefore uh, G one must be one. Okay, uh, so this is another way of computing uh, the genus of a curve using the Riemann uh, Hurwitz formula, and you can use this to compute also the genus of other uh, other curves. Uh, typically, you send you find some map that maps to some curve where you know the genus of that curve and then use that and compute all the ramification to compute the genus of your curve above. Okay, so I think I'm out of time. So I'm going to stop here and I will see you next time.